Well, I think everyone needs downtime, but I think the mistake is thinking that we don't have it. I mean, there is always downtime in life. It's just a question of how much. And I track my time. I can see where all my 168 hours are going. And because of that, I know there is downtime. Like I know there is, un- well, I would call it unstructured time. I mean, sometimes you're still around the kids, right? You know, and so it's not 100% leisure. Hi, I'm Maya. I'm an executive coach, published author, and mom of two. Welcome to The Golden Hour, your weekly dose of executive and life coaching magic. Maybe you're one of the hundreds of amazing executives I've worked with, or simply wishing to live a life with intention, color, and without regrets. Either way, we all need that weekly dose of inspiration and support to elevate our work and lives. So let's get to it. Hello and welcome to a very exciting episode of The Golden Hour. Today I have Laura Vanderkam with me on the show and we're going to be talking about her new book, Tranquility by Tuesday. And I'm also going to ask all the things that I've ever wanted to ask Laura. So really looking forward to this conversation. And I have done a whole separate episode, an intro into Laura and how her work has influenced me since I had kids. So do go back and have a listen to that. But that should allow us to discuss some more focused questions on Laura's book today and really zoom into some of the topical stuff that's in her latest book. So that leaves it to me to hand over to Laura and say hi. Hi, Laura. Great to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So it'd be great to put this book into context, right? Tranquility by Tuesday. It'd be lovely for those who haven't read all of your books for you to just give a bit of an overview of where Tranquility by Tuesday sits amongst your other books on time management and how to make the most of our time. Yeah, well, it turned out it was very important that the covers all match. So we're within one color scheme. It's, uh, you know, in case people want to buy all the books, we want to heartily encourage that. Um, but yeah, no, it, Tranquility by Tuesday is, I think, my my sixth full-length time management book. And it, people are like, well, how could you say anything new? But the thing is, time is just a fascinating concept because everybody has the same amount of it. I mean, it, it, there's just this fundamental truth about time that no matter who you are, you have 24 hours in a day, you have 168 hours in a week, and side nine, there there are some societies that don't do weeks, but those people are highly unlikely to be reading this book, right? If you're in a society where you're reading this book, you probably think of your life in weeks. And so we're all working with these same building blocks. And so when you find people who are doing amazing things with their time, both professionally and personally, like, you know, it's not that they have access to extra hours than the rest of us. I mean, they Mm -hmm. may have other things going for them. I'm not saying they're not smarter or richer or better looking than all the rest of us, but they don't have more time. And so I've just keep mining that vein there for (laughs) what I can come up with. And I've explored different aspects of time, you know, trying to get people to treat time in terms of a week with 168 hours, exploring morning routines and what the most successful people do before breakfast, looking at professional women raising children at the same time, how they spend their time for, I know how she does it, but Tranquility by Tuesday is kind of going back to my roots. It's a very sort of basic time management book. You you don't need to be in the advanced class to, to read this. It's very much nine habits that can help anyone feel better about their time, to help them feel more in control of their time, help them feel like they are using their time in ways that are meaningful and enjoyable for themselves and people they care about, help people feel like they are wasting less time. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that it it would work. So it's a project. I had 150 people try out these rules and I wrote the book about what happened when they did. And so that's the result. Yeah, it's fascinating. And you're probably very good at rattling off all nine rules quickly. Do you think that's worth doing for our listeners or do you think it's better to just zoom in? Does it become overwhelming? Up to well, you. I can. I mean, I can say them if you want. You can cut it later if you decide it's bad. But uh, rule one is to give yourself a bedtime. Rule two, plan on Fridays. Rule three, move before 3 p.m. Rule four, three times a week is a habit. Rule five, create a backup slot. Rule six, one big adventure, one little adventure. Rule seven, take one night for you. Rule eight, batch the little things. And rule nine, effortful before effortless. 
Brilliant. And I am interested in your process. And I wanted to ask how you arrived at those nine rules. And were there any that were close contenders that didn't quite make it into the special nine? Yeah. So the reason I came up with these nine is because I've seen thousands of schedules over the years. You know, I've done these huge time tracking projects. I've done time tracking challenges. People send me their schedules. People often ask for feedback. And I found that I was often giving the same advice. Like even though people's lives are very different, even Mm -hmm. though people could be in different professions, different stages of life, many people would benefit from various things that I found myself saying over and over again. And so around 2019, I decided to start honing those things down. What advice was I giving most frequently? And Mm -hmm. so I looked through that, I came up with these nine catchphrases that that get at these nine concepts that I was saying over and over again to people. And then in the course of the project, you know, tested those particular nine things out. I mean, there's lots of advice we could add into it. I was joking with somebody recently that the 10th rule might be one of my favorite sayings, which is that people are a good use of time, yep. um, which, you know, could be its own book entirely. But uh, all of these are are things that can help us. I was wondering about that people one because I do hear you use that phrase a lot, but I guess you've got many phrases over the years and there's only so many that can be condensed down into a a set of meaningful rules. And I guess for listeners, some of those will be more sort of obvious, I guess, like move by three, people can maybe make sense of that. But I think you've got some real good shifts in mindset for people as well within the rules that it would be nice to drill into. So for example, the creating a backup slot, I think is just such a fascinating concept. And the more I've listened to your things, actually, I'm seeing you talking about creating that white space. And so it would be lovely to hear also about your own backup slots, like how you make that work for you and and how you protect that. Because it's not easy. Yeah, no, it's not. Rule number five is to create a backup slot. And and what I mean by this, you know, if anyone has been invited to, say, an outdoor picnic in the summer, often the organizers will say on the invitation, like, the rain date is this second date. It's really such a brilliant concept if you think about it. The organizers are acknowledging that much can go predictably wrong outside. I mean, it's right there in the rain date name. But there's no question of whether the event will be rescheduled or when. Like, it will be for the rain date. So if you did, in fact, want to go to this event, you would know not to put anything unmovable in the second slot. And by having the second slot, like, most likely you won't need it. But if you do, it vastly increases the chances of the original event happening, even if not when originally planned. And so that is what we want to do with everything in life. Like we, we need a rain date for all sorts of things in life because it turns out to rain a lot, you know, all sorts of metaphorical rain can come into our lives. People get sick. People have unexpected things come up. Planes are delayed, whatever it is. I, like there's all sorts of unexpected stuff. There's unexpected good stuff too. I mean, maybe, you know, a brand new client or somebody like calls them up randomly. I want you to do this project for me. Like, you know, you want to find a spot for it. Like you can't if every single minute is, is booked solid. So in general, we need to build some open space into life. It is there to absorb the overflow when stuff goes wrong and life happens. It is there to absorb the good stuff. If something new and good and unexpected happens, you have a space to put it. Now, obviously, it is not easy to create open space in life or everyone would already already be doing it. But there's a couple of things you can do. If you're in the sort of job where you have a reasonable amount of control over your schedule, trying to create one open day would be really helpful. I I try not to schedule much on Friday. I, we are recording this on Friday, I'm sort of bending my rules during a book launch time. But, uh, you know, in general, I try not to schedule too much on Friday so that it is there to absorb the overflow when, when things happen during the week. Maybe it's two afternoons a week. Somebody could try to leave open. Maybe it's an hour or two every day. You know, if you're somebody who books a lot of appointments, maybe you schedule a break in in there, like an intentionally longer lunch, you know, that you end your last appointment at 1230, don't start the next one till 130 or something. Is there just space to absorb overflow or any opportunities that come up? Now, you know, we don't always have 100% control over our schedule, but, you know, you can get better about recognizing when open space does occur, that you might be able to seize and protect once it is there. You might be able to be a little bit more judicious 
about what you take on. I always encourage people to do a calendar triage every week to, as we're, we're thinking about our upcoming weeks, you can look at your calendar and, and see, you know, what's on there that you don't think is going to happen. Like something that's been rescheduled four times is, is not going to happen this week either. So like, just go ahead and write it off. Maybe somebody's asked for 30 minutes on your calendar, but you can see that it's like a question, you know, you'll be able to answer in two minutes. So you should just pick up the phone and call them and get it off your calendar. I mean, there's all sorts of things yeah. you can do if you're thinking about it. And if you are valuing open space, But what I'm trying to do with this rule is get people to value open space, to not feel like they do need to fill every minute. Like filling every minute is not a sign of like being awesome. Like it's a sign that you have to have everything go perfectly in order for your life to work. And I don't know about you, but my life never does go perfectly. So I'd rather build an open space. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's so funny that you talk about this rain date because you'd think in the UK we'd be really good with rain dates because it rains a lot here, but we don't do, we don't use it enough. So we, those picnics carry so much stress with them because yeah. everyone's worried. It's, like it's going to rain. What are we yeah. going to do? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody thinks to put a rain date in. That's genius. I mean, I was thinking about it in terms of a work calendar, but actually putting that more into place in terms of weather and real events and family events and all kinds of things is really cool as well. So love that. The other rule I wanted to ask you more about is batch the little things, because that's something you talk about a lot in your content. And I just wanted to know if you have a way of thinking about what counts as little things. So a little thing, we're batching the little things. It's things that are not terribly important and usually not terribly urgent, right? It's hard to have a comprehensive list of all the little things because their nature makes that difficult. But just as an example, you know, maybe it's responding to invitations, sort of non-urgent email responses that you've been thinking about an answer. You have to respond at some point, but you didn't need to write immediately. Maybe it's paying bills. Maybe it is things in your personal, like filling out children's permission slips or, you know, signing kids up for various activities or, you know, booking airline tickets or anything like that. It's going to take a little bit of effort, but probably it doesn't require your best self. And so we want to set a time for these things for a couple reasons. One, we don't want them to always be hanging over our head. If you set a time and say like, okay, I'm going to tackle all the things on my little things list at 1.30 in the afternoon, then then you don't have to feel guilty that you're not doing it the rest of the time. Like, oh, I need to really get back to that person. And then that distracts you from whatever work you're doing. And also, when we batch the little things, we can let ourselves relax. I mean, I suggest people batch household chores, for instance, on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you say like, oh, I'm going to do all my chores between 10 and noon on Saturday, it does a couple of things. I mean, one, it forces some efficiencies because if it didn't happen in that two hour window, like it probably wasn't the most important thing because you're going to force yourself to do the, the most important stuff first. But then, you know, if you find yourself looking at a dirty floor at some other time and you say, well, no, you know, I don't, I don't need to worry about that right now. There's a time for dealing with the dirty floor. Now is not that time. I'm, I'm able to relax and, and enjoy my weekend. That's really nice for helping us be more intentional with different segments of our time. I guess one of the things that comes up for me when I think about that rule is, all of those things, which they're, they're not quite in the unimportant category, they, they're quite important. They're still bitty, might be about health insurance, finance, that, but they're still not my main work, right? They're still not the stuff that's going to move my life forward. And I was just curious if you have a separate category for that or how you treat that stuff. And then with five kids, you must have a lot of that other stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I do. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I think it can still go. I mean, even if it's not really little, I mean, I put like sending invoices and, and stuff in paying bills or things like that in my little things category. I mean, you know, obviously I want to get paid and I need to pay everyone else too. I mean, it does truly have to happen, right? Or it might yeah. even be, you know, booking a vacation or something like that, but it doesn't have to happen at a certain time. And it's not those things that are moving, you know, the career life forward or anything like that. So as much as possible, batching those things in a chunk of time that is not your best time, right? Most people have more energy and discipline and focus in the morning. Not everyone, but a lot of people. And if you fall into that category, you shouldn't batch the little things at like 9am, right? Don't do it first and then think, oh, I'm going to get to everything else. Like, no, no, do your important work first. And then at a time when your energy is dipping and it's kind of fun to have all these little wins, like, woohoo, I just ordered a present. I just filled out the form. I just crossed this off my list. Like do that mid afternoon when you when your energy would be low. Yeah. Okay. That makes, that makes sense. And then the other rule that I think is really interesting is taking one night for you. 
if I was to summarize it, my understanding is it's about taking some time, couple of hours in an evening to do a pursuit, something that is of interest to you. Uh, yeah. And, and ideally it involves a commitment to it, right? Like, yeah. you know, I mean, people could be like, well, I want to read. I mean, okay. Yeah. Like we all love to read, but that, that could kind of happen whenever. I mean, I would like people to think about broader than that, sort of like within your community, what could you commit to doing? Maybe you want to join a, a softball team mm -hmm. or, you know, play in a tennis league or volunteer regularly somewhere, join a choir, join a community orchestra, be in a play. I mean, just something that actually requires a commitment. So you'll do it. Like, yeah. right. You'll, you'll actually go. Whereas people are like, oh, well, you know, I plan to read on Tuesday nights. Well, you can see what's going to go wrong with this. I mean, like work runs late. You'd be like, no, 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 this is my night to read. Like, you're not going to say that. Right. Or if you're, you know, family, like your kids are like, oh, we want you to take us to the store. And you're like, oh, well, no, 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 this is my night to read. Like people just don't do that. Right. Whereas if you yeah. are playing second base, like on your softball team, like you got to be there. Right. You know, and, yeah. and so people actually go. And so it forces it to happen. There's an accountability layer, I guess, in that social, sounds like often there's a social element to it. And I saw in some of your blogs, there were people talking about maybe doing it at different times if the evening logistics were just not realistic. Some of us have flexible schedules, so it is conceivable that I could do something in the middle of the day or even first thing. And I was wondering if there was anything specific about that kind of evening weekday slot for you or whether it does, it could be flexible. Well, it's just that's when a lot of things do tend to meet um, yeah. to account for people being at work during the day. But yeah, it could be a couple of hours on a weekend. Um, the point is to make sure that it is, you know, ideally a regular recurring time. So it can become your time. You start looking forward to it. You know, it's built into your calendar so everyone around you can expect it. Um, and, and so, you know, yeah, if you go for a two hour bike ride with a particular friend every Saturday morning, like that would be your time, right? Like that is, you know, your night for you and you come to expect it and people, you know, around you come to expect it as well. I really like that. And I think there is more of an angle in it than just self-care and me time. I think there's something broader and more community based in what you're saying. So I think it's really nice to draw that out. There is one more, which is the three times a week as a habit. And again, this is great. And you talk about this a lot. And I know that that might for you be things like piano and you've described family meals and, and those sorts of things. Do you use it for any work things? And this is a leading question because I'm curious if I can also think about certain parts of my work in that way. Absolutely. Um, so this rule that three times a week is a habit is really about asking, well, what are the things we would like to do regularly in our lives, but we feel like maybe we are not devoting enough time to them? And the question is, can we get to three times a week? Because I maintain that anything that happens three times a week is something that has happened, re happens regularly in your life. And so maybe for somebody that would be like, networking. I want to make sure that I am doing three things that I would fall in the networking category each week. And so that would force you to think about it and say, well, you know, I feel like I'm not doing enough networking. How can I make sure I do three things? And then you look at your schedule and say, well, okay, I see that I'm already scheduled to do this, you know, phone call with someone that's great. Now I need to think of two more things. So maybe I'm going to, um, you know, join this webinar that I wanted to go to and see who's there and say hello to people in the chat. And then, you know, maybe I will go to an event, you know, a breakfast event on Friday or something. But you wouldn't have done those two things otherwise if you hadn't said, like, I want to do this three times a week. But on the other hand, you know, it's not all the time, right? Like three times a week is not every single day. And the problem is like, you know, often with things, if we are, if we're only viewing time in terms of a day, like you get to the end of the day, you're like, I didn't do anything for networking. Well, okay. But it didn't have to happen every single day. As long as it's something that is happening reasonably regularly, you can have it be part of your identity. Yeah. And that week concept is something you talk about a lot, isn't it? That life happens in weeks. And I'm curious where that comes from. Is that something that you've come to understand through all of the work that you've done? Or was there a, an original point where, where that became clear to you or was written somewhere? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it was in the course of, as I was getting ready to write my first time management book, which was called 168 hours, which turns out to be the number of hours in a week. That was actually an angle that we kind of, the, the team that was working with me on, on getting a book concept and that was going to clear the bar. Like we were all like, wait, 168 hours. I'd put that somewhere in there, like multiplying 24 times seven. We're like, yeah, you know, people say that no one ever multiplies it through. And so we're like, that's, that's worth thinking about, right? Like what, what does that change when we think 168 hours in a week? And, and it, it changes a lot. I mean, it shows you how much time there is 
Um, you know, the numbers I always do for people is if you are working 40 hours a week, standard full-time job, sleeping eight hours a night. So that is 56 hours per week. You have 72 hours for other things. And obviously plenty of that time could be devoted to family and household responsibilities, but even so there's probably some other time too, you know, it's a lot of time. Um, and, and so, uh, we need to be aware of that and think about how we wish to spend it, even if we are working full-time as well, just in terms of, the more I think about it, the, the more I do see how important it is to think in terms of a week. It's really the repeating pattern, the unit of repeat in our lives. You know, if somebody's saying, mm-hmm. what's a typical yeah. day? Well, it could be Tuesday. It could be Saturday. I, I don't know. They look very different, but they both occur just as often and they have the same number of hours. So why is one more typical than the other, right? But if you have a whole week, you really see what your life truly looks like because probably most of the things that happen that week will then be repeated the next week in terms of yeah. of the standard stuff. I love that. The unit of repeat. I've written that down. We're taking a short break from this episode in order for me to let you know about an exciting upcoming event that I have for you all. I'm partnering with the amazing coaching platform Wondersource to bring you a transformational golden hour where I will take you through two of my coaching pillars, visioning and power relationships at work. And this is to help you get career clarity, clarity on the direction that you want to take your career and harness power relationships at work. Why are we doing this workshop? Since resuming this season of the golden hour, I'm getting more and more individual requests for coaching. But you may or may not know that I primarily work B2B. That is, I work with organizations who sponsor the executive coaching for their leaders. I know that often when individuals are thinking about career transition and next steps, they want coaching that is separate from their organization. And this is why I want to be able to have more interactive B2C offerings for my individuals, my podcast listeners, and those that follow along my content on Instagram and LinkedIn. This workshop on the 16th of November, 2022 at 6 p.m. UK time is an awesome £15 per ticket with an early bird discount of £10 per ticket. So it's a no brainer. The link to the event and a more detailed description is in the show notes. And if you can't attend due to time zone differences, you can still purchase the ticket and we will send you a copy of the recording. I hope to see you there. Now back to the episode. And actually, I did have a question about 168 hours. So this this concept also changed my life when you started talking about it and I read your book and it did make me look at time differently. The question I always have with this is, it can be really optimistic, isn't it? So you can have the person who does the exercise, the homeschooling, then afterwards they're doing their own work and they're fitting all of these things. And you've talked about this sort of thing. And it sounds amazing. The maths fits and in terms of like a puzzle piece, it all fits together. But in my mind, I'm thinking, gosh, you know, from an energy perspective, our energy is so different, right? We said like at 9am, it's different. And to what extent do you think in that 70 hours remaining or whatever, that decompression, downtime, do you, is it factored in? Do you, are you quite aware of it? Does it matter for you personally as well? I'm always curious. Yeah, well, I think everyone needs downtime, but I think the mistake is thinking that we don't have it. I mean, there is always downtime in life. It's just a question of how much. And I track my time. I can see where all my 168 hours are going. And because of that, I know there is downtime. Like I know there is, well, I would call it unstructured time. I mean, sometimes you're still around the kids, right? You know, and so it's not 100% leisure, but it's definitely unstructured time. And, you know, even very, very busy people with lots of commitments in their time, again, seem to have some unstructured time as well. I actually was calculating this for somebody the other day and thinking about, oh, the crazy weekends with kids activities. So there are, you know, let's say if you're sleeping eight hours a night, you would have 32 waking hours on Saturday and Sunday. If there were, you know, five kids activities requiring two hours of peace with driving and you had a half day adventure, like five hours and maybe two hours for worship services somewhere, like we would still have 15 hours of unstructured time. I mean, it's a ton of time. Like that sounds like a packed full weekend, but there's still all this time. And usually it's less than that because, you know, activities have simultaneously or, you know, trade off who's covering it and such. So, you know, I can find, I find that even weekends that are full have open space, unstructured time, you know? So yeah, I, the energy question matters um, and it matters a lot. 
there may be some people who have more energy than others, though I think a lot of times when people have a lot of energy, it is because they have built in good habits to their lives that support that. So for instance, getting adequate and orderly sleep, um, getting the amount of sleep you need every single night instead of you know, undershooting and overshooting, getting regular physical activity. That is something that will add to your energy levels. Um, And then obviously other things we can do to take care of ourselves, like eating healthfully, having supportive family and friends, and then building in stuff in your life that you were looking forward to. And when you don't want to do stuff, that's when our energy is like, oh, I don't feel like doing anything. Well, it's because you don't have anything you want to do. Whereas if you put stuff into your life that you truly do want to do, that can renew your spirit for, I mean, absolutely everything else. Yeah. And this is the positive message behind so much of what you talk about, because you're talking about planning for all that fun and joy, not just to make everything fit in. I love that. And actually, now we're getting into a little bit of the other stuff that I wanted to ask you, which is the context of your life and how you do it all, because it's still a mystery to me how you manage to do everything that you do. So I do do have a few questions around that. And the first is that this is a particularly busy time for you, right? You've described it on your blog. It's a crazy wave. And so in terms of your rules, are you hoping to use all of them for best effect, like use a full nine and get the really powerful outcome or do you see yourself maybe picking the most, the ones that are most relevant for you now and really kind of focusing in? Well, I, I definitely think that the rules are doable even during crazy times. And in fact, I think they're more helpful the sort of busier you are because that's when you need the reminder to get up and move by 3 p.m. That's when you need the reminder like, hey, you can find three short spots during the week to do something like play the piano and you'll feel better if you do that as a break instead of just check your email. So uh, planning in an adventure, like don't feel like life is just a slog, like do something fun, right? You know, it's when times are busiest that we need these rules the most. So yeah, I'm certainly trying to do them. I don't always do it always successfully, but I'm trying. uh, and, And so hopefully we'll be able to stick with it. Building on from that, I guess, is that you people do see you as a time guru. You are a master of role modeling that, right? Because you do it with with the five kids and the two podcasts and everything else. That also requires choices, you know, as well as these great rules. But you you must be, you know, quite intentional about what you choose to do with your time and what you don't. And for our listeners, I think it would be great to hear maybe some of the things you actively choose not to do and how that might help to maximize your time and make the most of your time. Yeah, I mean, there's there's various things I, I don't do. I mean, um, probably a lot of our, our housework winds up being outsourced. I mean, there's still, you know, with five kids in a house, there's always something to be due. So it's not like I do nothing. I do a reasonable amount of it, but I don't do all of it. For instance, we share all of us driving responsibilities with my husband and I and our nanny, like switch off on kid driving for various things. I'm probably less involved with various volunteering opportunities than I could be at some other point in my life. I'm sure I don't watch a lot of TV. I mean, honestly, that is the trade-off. Like I don't do that. But if you don't do that, like there's a lot of open time. If you look at how many hours a lot of people watch stuff. So, you know, even if it's just two hours a day, that would be 14 hours a week. Like that's, you know, a lot of time to do stuff. So not having that be a default activity is, is opens up a reasonable amount of space as well. Would you say that because of your time tracking that you do and being so aware, it just doesn't make sense for you to spend any time watching TV or is it just something that happens to have never been of interest? I guess I just don't find it of much interest. Um, You know, maybe if there was a a wonderful show that I found very exciting, I, I just don't like there's nothing I really truly want to get into at this point. And that makes it easier not to worry about it. Like I'm not trying to find something, I guess is what I would say. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of wonderful shows out there and, and, you know, people do amazing creative work. I certainly don't want to disparage it, but you know, it's not something that has, has a place in my life right now. Yeah. And between you and Sarah, uh, in your best of both worlds podcast, you have a lot of kids and it's really helped people like myself think, okay, how am I going to make the kids, the work, time for myself all fit together? And it's helped immeasurably. One thing that I always am amazed by is, so if my kids have chronic ill stuff, so they'll have like a tummy thing that's gone on longer than it should, or one of them had an ear issue that just went from one thing to the other. And we had to go around the specialists and it just, it, it kind of chipped away at my energy because it was a constant, you know, and it was pain and and all of that stuff. When it's things like that, how do you guys cope or how do you cope? Or 
have you just been blessed and not have that stuff not come up or I'm just really curious about those sorts of curveballs I guess well um, yeah I mean life throws us curveballs for sure mm-hmm. and and anyone can wind up with stuff that goes on for a while and having to deal with I mean it's just it's got to be built into life like anything else I mean you expect the unexpected to happen that's why we leave open space right so stuff comes up you can deal with it um, you shouldn't especially as you have multiple kids you can't expect that everything will go perfectly you need to build in time to account for the fact that it won't, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. And as much as possible, sharing the load as you can. And then just keep asking, like, what's important for, you know, me to do right now? And maybe if there is something that is a, you know, acute medical issue that has to be dealt with right then, then it's going to bump something else. But that's fine. As long as you know what absolutely does have to happen, you can keep doing those things and dealing with the medical issue at the same time. Wow. So we've actually gone back now to that almost create a backup slot and create the open space. That's really helpful to make that link. Love it. You've solved one of my big issues. So thank you for the advice. And I've jotted it down. Yeah. Well, (laughs) even just, I mean, I know, you know, during when I've been in like the baby phase with, with kids, I would really kind of dial down to like, what are the things that absolutely have to happen today? Like what are the most important things? And it might only be three things, but in the course of 24 hours, you can probably do three things like even if other stuff is going on um you know and and that's how you stay on track build an open space you do stuff before it's due you build in a buffer and and then you know when stuff comes up it comes up I always get this sense that it's fine you know when you've it sounds like you've been doing it forever right you've been doing this so you've always got the buffers you've always got the time but there'll be people that will be thinking gosh I'm in a hole right now I'm in a like I've, I've got to climb myself out I've got so much I'm so much backlog and I just wonder for them to hear it. I hope that it would, they'd find a way to do it as well. You know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, the hole is never so dig deep probably that you can't dig out. Um, You know, you just need to look at what's on your plate, triage it. What do you, what can you get rid of? Like what doesn't matter to you? Maybe you can get rid of those things. Um, Lay out everything that's there, you know, start making a plan to get through it, to chip away at it and try not to take on new stuff while that's still going on. And and then you'll slowly get out of the hole. Love it. Okay. A couple more questions that I must ask you. So consistency. So as well as time on consistency, I think you, you're, you're an absolute inspiration. You've never missed a best of both worlds podcast episode. And by the way, I have heard every single one and then your before breakfast never misses a beat either. And funnily enough, when, when I told my daughter, oh, I'm interviewing Laura Vandercam, she said, Oh, is that before breakfast lady? So <laughs> even she before knows. breakfast lady. Hey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because she always sees that coming up on my phone in the morning as a notification. So So even with your time tracking, it's just incredible how you keep these things going. And I just wonder, do you ever have moments when you go, ah, you know, just, just, you know, I'm waning. I feel like slacking off the whole thing, you know, what motivates you to keep such great levels of consistency in these areas? Well, I mean, I try not to take on things that I'm not going to want to do, I guess is is how I would say it. Like I'm not making myself do something I don't want to. And if there, and none of this stuff actually takes that much time, right? Like, so before breakfast is, you know, they're five minute episodes. So I've timed it out. It's, it's fewer than five hours a week, right? Like total from the writing, the practicing and the recording. It, It tends to be, you know, maybe 10 on the big weeks, but it's like five to 10 hours a week. And so, yeah, it's, it's just, it's not that much. So it's not that hard to keep going. Yeah. Was, um, that, was that, sorry, was that five hours for before breakfast? Or was that, that was for before breakfast. Best of both worlds is, is even probably fewer than that because it's, you know, a 40 minute show once a week. So we record it in, you know, and I, I don't have to script it, right? Like we do notes, but it's, it's not as tightly scripted. So, so yeah, that, that winds up being maybe, you know, just a few hours as well. And so, so none of it takes that much time. And so if anyone wants to stay consistently with anything, like first make sure that it's, very doable. Like it's a bite-sized amount of work. Like that's the kind of thing you'll stay with. You won't stay with something that's just like grueling. If you want to do it, like that's another thing. Like, do you actually genuinely enjoy it? And if you do, that's again, you will probably stick with it in a way that you won't if if you don't feel like it. So one question I, I put out there, I wrote a piece once called the question to ask if, you know, see if a habit will stick. And it was like, would you do this on vacation? So if you're trying to bite off something for the long term, it's a question to ask yourself, like, would I do this on vacation? And if you would, 
yeah, you've got a habit that you're probably going to stick with. Like if you're, if you're looking for reasons not to do it though, like if you're like, oh yeah, I would totally use a vacation to like not do it. Well, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't attempt it, but you just need to keep in mind that it's going to be harder for you to do that thing and to stick with that thing than something that you're like, oh yeah, I totally do. And people are like, well, what? No vacations. Of course, those are totally separate. We don't do our, you know, we don't have to do our habits on this, but you brush your teeth. Like you brush your teeth on vacation and you don't sit there and whine about it either, right? Yeah. Like, so there's totally things that you do on vacation yeah. that are healthy habits or good habits. It's just, you know, that it's small. You feel better afterwards. You're, you're not, you know, wrapping up as this big oppressive thing. So, you know, that's why we stick with it. Yeah, no, I love that question. Would you do it on vacation? What a great stress test if you're going to try and make a commitment to something. Okay, so we hear a lot of time diaries on your podcast and people talk through their their days. And I'm curious because I've, I've heard your time diaries, a few different versions of them as, as things have gone along. But if you could describe your ideal day, either a weekday or a non-weekday, could you, could you give us some ideas about what that might look like? For now, I'm, I've sort of accepted what our morning routine is that, you know, people are up and have to get to school. And so I'm dealing with that. Ideally, I'd be able to start work for sure around eight o'clock, which is when our, our nanny comes to work. My two-year-old is a little bit, you know, mommy oriented right now. So sometimes it's hard to sort of pass him along for the final stages of getting ready for things. But uh, ideally, I'd start work then I'd, I'd generally go for a run, maybe at some point in the afternoon, you know, I'd be working on projects I enjoy all day. You know, the afternoons, it's it's kind of cool to go for a walk or something during a kid activity or you get outside for a while, have a family dinner. You know, ideally people would be in bed on time. I, but I like <laughs> to build in adventures during the week as well. And, you know, Thursday nights I go to choir. So that's uh, that goes in there too at some point in the week. So lots of things like that. And I love it because your ideal is actually sounds like not very far off a typical current, maybe not this week, but other weeks. So, so how nice is that? And so then my final question was that I know your work addresses a lot on this topic, basically of managing all the different pieces, right? On a psychological level, how do you resolve or do you, do you need to resolve a tension if there is one between having this large family that's has continued to grow over the last five years and then the demands and aspirations of your work and especially because it's about making the most of your time, do you ever feel, I don't know, a sense of tension there and, or conflict? And I'm just curious about how you would resolve that. Or is that what your work sort of does? Well, that's kind of my work. I mean, I maintain that there isn't really a tension. And, you know, sometimes I have to be good about my time in both areas, right? Like thinking about like, what do I really need to focus on right now? And let me see that through and make sure that I've got a solution to that problem, then keep going with this. And, you know, sometimes there's a lot going on at once, like right now there is, but it's all a phase, right? Like right now work is very busy because of the book launch, but there will be times when it'll be less so. There are certain phases when the kid stuff is more intense and I need to be dealing with that. But, you know, that will pass too. Like every, you know, that's one of the things of parenthood, like this too is a phase. Everything is a phase, like for good or for bad. It's it's always a phase. Like there will be a different phase after that. So this happens to be a particularly intense one right now, partly because the book is coming out and we just had back to school stuff, which, you know, is always yeah. Yeah. adjustments of new schedules. But, you know, we're getting into a bit of a routine and, and I w- it will be less, you know, it, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. So much optimism in all of your messages and clearly echoed in in all of your responses as well. So thank you so much, Laura. It's just been great to hear from you. And thanks for allowing me to probe a bit because I've (laughs) been accumulating these questions over the years. So it's absolutely a joy for me to be able to ask them directly to you. So I really appreciate your time and best of luck with the book launch. And so for listeners, how can they get hold of your book? Tranquility by Tuesday. You can get it where books are sold, order it online. You know, especially I, international listeners, um, ebooks are probably the way to go uh, for that. But you can always visit my website, lauravandercam.com, and you can learn more about my books and my podcast there. I think sometimes in the UK, we might get a delay. So I'll be keeping an eye on when we actually get hold of the book. Yeah. Um, And anything else that you want to make listeners aware of that you've got coming up? No, that's uh, that's good. Yeah. If even if you uh, can't get the physical copy, then you can always uh, post about it on social media and let other people know about it. That would be really helpful to me. 
Brilliant. And you've got some beautiful graphics about your nine rules and things, which are very shareable. So yeah. Thank you so much, Laura. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Golden Hour podcast. If you found it valuable, please forward it to others who you think might benefit from listening and be sure to subscribe to get the new episodes when they release. And if you're listening on iTunes, please leave a rating or review as it really helps the show to grow. You can find me at Maya Goodka on Twitter and Instagram, and you can find links to what we cover in the episodes in the show notes. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Oh,